Hello, all you beautiful Texans. Welcome back to the James Show. News Talk 820 WBAP now on FM at 93.3. Look, colleges and protesting go together. There's nothing new that college kids, the, the demographic among us that has probably the most free time and the fewest actual responsibilities and burdens are the ones that are most likely to take to the street or go camp out in the quad or hold a rally or do something with the bullhorn. When's the last time you did anything with the bullhorn? When's your last bullhorn interaction? Uh, regular regular practice, though, on college campuses. <clears throat> I, I got to say, not every college campus, but in light of the tit-for-tat that has flared up between Israel and uh, its neighbors in the Middle East, uh, some of these protesters have ramped up along with it. And in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a new sort of wellspring uh, in light of the Iranian attack on Israel, the Israel counterstrike against Iran. And we have uh, more people coming out protesting. Well, a ca- an encampment has set up in a few campuses. And we were talking about this a little bit uh, yesterday where you saw some things that you know, protesting is one thing, but there is such thing as taking it maybe just a little too far. So for the people who are at Yale blocking Jewish students from going to class, we classify that here on the James show as a little too far. Anytime you stand in the doorway and prevent people from going to class, you're probably not on the right side of history. Uh, among those protesting is a student body. At Columbia, it's one of the Ivy League schools. It's right in the middle of New York City. And you know how much we love New York City. New York City! Get a rope. Among those protesting is the daughter of one of your least favorite congresswomen, Ilhan Omar. She's going to Columbia. She's in the Barnhard College of Business, I think is what it's called. Uh, She has been suspended from the Barnhard College at Columbia for her participation in the protest. And look, that's unfortunate. You should be able to protest without, you know, getting kicked out of school. <clears throat> but she's so victimized and she's so downtrodden and she she's so repressed, oppressed by this system, S- systemic racism and, you know, misogyny and whatever else is uh, that she had no choice but to go on and be a guest on MSNBC to plead her case. So she shows up on MSNBC yesterday and she's wearing the kafir, you know, the like the scarf. Sometimes they put it around their head. Sometimes, sometimes they just put it around their neck. And it looks, uh, it's white with the the black webbing and the dots on it. It's the same thing Yasser Arafat wore all through the 80s and 90s and 2000s until he passed away. And and, and it's the Palestinian. Is that for Fatah? Is that what that means? That that pattern? Because kind of like the Scotch have like different plaids for each one of their clans. Uh, They have different kafirs for each one of the groups. And this is, I don't know, I see it frequently. You've seen it frequently. You probably know what I'm talking about. But MSNBC's Ahman Moyedlin, I don't think I'm saying that right, had her name's Isra Hirsi. That's the daughter of Rep. Ilhan Omar. And another woman who is a Palestinian student at Columbia, uh, Mariam Alwan. Now, they're just two of more than 100 students that were arrested at the pro-Palestinian protests last week and when when you hear it from them you have a little bit of sympathy for them because when you're this young when you're in college when you're 20 and you come up you come out with the wrong political opinion it's kind of hard to think well you're an idiot you don't know any better because they are idiots and they don't know any better when you were 20 you were an idiot and you didn't know any better i was an idiot i didn't know any better so it's you know it's it's like you don't punish a child for saying a word wrong he's not supposed to know that so i i have no real complaint that they're right winding up on the wrong side but i i do try and listen to it intently because i just remember my entire college career if someone had invited me to a protest and i don't think anyone ever did i would say no i don't, I don't think i'm gonna do that no I don't, i'm not i'm not gonna sleep in the quad uh it's almost finals i got things to do uh, I, I would like to go on a date. I've, I've been chatting up Melissa for a few weeks now. I, w- I want to see if that goes somewhere. Uh, so I, I just, I don't have the mindset for this. And I admit my faults, try and understand what some of these kids are going through. And sometimes when you talk to these protesters, I get it. So let's see if Isra Hirsi, Ilhan Omar's daughter, let's hear her explain her protesting. 
Um, I was suspended Thursday morning at 10 a.m. with two other fellow Barnard students. Um, the email stated that we had engaged in disruptive behavior but had not outlined the code of conduct that we had violated. Um, the three of us were the only three that had done public interviews at that point. And so we think that our targeting or our the reason we got suspended so early was due to the fact that we had made ourselves known. Yes. Yes. All, all, all of this is correct. And none of this bothers me. Of course. You're not being singled out and picked on. You're the one that's talking to the media. You, you're like, well, it's only us three that talk to the media, so I wonder why they're singling us out. Probably because you talk to the media. Probably because you said some things that the that make the university look bad. Probably there's somewhere in the paperwork where you've signed something saying that you're not going to go to the media and say things that make them look bad without some sort of disciplinary action. Uh, so, so far, I don't feel sorry for you. Not that I'm you know, mean-spirited or, ha-ha, I'm glad you... You got suspended. I, I wish you didn't get suspended, really. But, you know, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. And if that's how the, the college feels about it, they have a right to do so. Uh, if, if I owned a college or I owned a business or I owned even a church and I had people that were camped out and cussing me in the media, and I don't mean literally cussing, I'm just saying running my name through the mud in the media, uh, I might suspend them too. All right, let's go to the uh, the next little clip here. Ilhan Omar on MSNBC. And this is great. I'm just setting all this up because in the next segment, we're going to talk to James Varney, who went to Columbia, now works for uh, the Real Clear Politics Organization. But uh, the next cut. Um, no, I think that the encampment was honestly one of the beautiful um, forms of solidarity. Um, we would be singing songs. We had meals together. People prayed together. They held Shabbat yesterday. Um, and it's really just been a very community centered space. Um, and also because of the fact that it is outside, it hadn't disrupted any classes um, and had really been a very isolated kind of moment where the zone in which we were actually protesting in is the demonstration zone that we are allowed to technically be able to protest in. And so the school had already placed this spot to be a place that is meant for this, these kind of actions. And yeah, yeah. So they, they have a special designated place in case you want to go camp out so you don't interrupt people. That all sounds good. I, you know, I think I like her better than her mom. All right. I, I saved the best clip for last here. This is the other one from Ilhan Omar's daughter. She was arrested at the Columbia protest last week, and she was a guest on MSNBC to plead her case. Let's see if this wins you over. ...are divesting or asking oh, Columbia University to... I, I should set this up better. Uh, the, the host of, on MSNBC asked, what are your demands at this protest? ...to divest from all companies that are complicit in genocide and actually have a hand in genocide, um, as well as transparency of Columbia's investments. These are not public information, as well as amnesty for all students that are actively being repressed and that were also suspended due to these pro-Palestinian protests. All right, I am... I'm all right, now I'm out. Anyone who calls this a genocide, you're not serious. You're not you're not you're you're incapable of complex thought and you're just repeating what someone else said. You know, the the Israelis if they wanted to genocide Gaza, they could do it in about 16 minutes from now. And I've been told my entire adult life that Israel's trying to genocide the Palestinians, but their population's growing. It's exploding. And I see Israel firing missiles on behalf of the defense of Israel more so than the offense against Gaza. You know, when was it, was it Iran firing 200 missiles at Israel or was it Israel firing 200 missiles at Iran? Anyway, it, here nor there, it's it, it, the, the conversation, the ability to have an intelligent d debate breaks down when they throw out genocide, because if they really, really believe that, then they have a, a fundamental misunderstanding that, I don't see. I do not see there an attempt of a genocide. Here's what I do see, and let's all be honest about this. Israel wants all that land, and they want it to be Israel. That's why they're putting settlements in, so they can creep up and take a little bit more here and a little bit more there and make the whole idea that we can separate this stuff out into two separate states impossible. Israel doesn't want to admit that, or at least their government doesn't want to admit that, and our allies over here don't want to admit that. I'm okay with it. I'm fine. I'm not, I don't care about a two-state solution. I don't care if Israel gets the whole thing. But it's silly to say they're genociding the Palestinians. It's silly to say that they're trying to wipe them off the planet because they could. If they wanted to, they could. My next guest, the ADLs will all, all day listeners will recognize him because he comes on the show every once in a while to talk politics because he works at the Real Clear outfit. Real Clear Politics, Real Clear Investigations is his bag. But James Varney, uh, I'm, I'm not going to ask you about your uh, journalism work today. You are also a graduate of... 
Columbia University. Oh, no. So you you have some insight on these protests. Did you know Ilhan Omar's daughter got arrested at your alma mater for protesting against Israel last week? I, I did know that. I think she's actually at Barnard, which is right across the street. Isn't that but, part of Columbia? That's what I understand. Is that a separate thing? It, it actually stayed separate. So back when they had the seven sisters and Ivy League schools would have a sister school, like Harvard had Radcliffe, uh, Columbia had Barnard. And when Columbia wanted to go co-ed, they wanted to merge with Barnard, but Barnard decided they wanted to stay uh, all female. So Barnard and Columbia are actually separate schools, but it's completely, you know, cross courses you can take anything at, at the other it's it's kind of the same but they see you, you, you you've made a, a a crucial mistake here varney you forget okay. that i am just a bumpkin who fell off a hay trailer like a month ago from the middle of nowhere east texas i did not know ivy league schools all had a sister college this is news to me i th- th- i didn't know about that till 30 seconds ago okay well they didn't all but yes some of them did so and, what's uh, harvard's Barnard, ilhan omar's daughter is a student at barnard which okay. is right across the street from literally right across the street from the journalism school where I went at Columbia and where this tent city that I'm sure a lot of your listeners have seen on TV is erected. All right. Tell me about this tent city, because uh, Ilhan Omar's daughter went on MSNBC. And it's like this is a specially designated place where we're allowed to protest and camp out as long as we want. Yeah, it's odd. It's it's the main quad there at Columbia. Uh, you, I'm sure a lot of your listeners have seen it in the movies, the Ghostbusters and other movies. And they're occupying a grassy area the, right in front of the journalism school and Butler Library. Um, and it is, of course, public. It's not private, which is a very odd thing. If, if, I don't know if any of your listeners saw this video last night. It was kind of cult-like where they were going to form this human chain and the woman talked about impinging on our privacy. It's like, this is a public space. Um, it's usually, uh, you know, an idyllic quad at a prestigious school. And it's turned into this uh, camp city. And I'm not quite sure, uh, everybody has theories, but I'm not 100% sure why they've allowed it. Did they have anything like this when you were there? No, they did not. But, um, you know, I was there a long time ago. But when I was there... Uh, Edward Said was really in his prime. He he was one of the top Columbia prof- uh, professors for 40 years. Am I supposed to know and, that name? Yeah, he wrote a book called Orientalism. And that kind of... Oh, hang on. I don't think we... Do, I think, do you have to dump that? I think you might have to... No, I'm just kidding. You don't have to dump that. It just sounds like a bad word. I'm having fun. Go ahead. Well, that really shifted. He was also an activist, a Palestinian activist, a rock thrower over in Gaza or the West Bank. Uh, very down with the uh, revolution. Uh, and he really wrenched Middle Eastern studies uh, far left. Um, so Colombia's always had uh, kind of left wing um, Middle Eastern studies department going back to when I was there. Um, and there are, I think, something like 100 faculty members have signed a letter in support of these students. We know that uh, they recently blocked a, a Jewish professor from entering uh, any of your listeners been to New York City, you know, it's, this is right on Broadway, right by the 116th Street stop on the uh, the one. And there's gates where normally you can just walk right into this quad. But I guess they've locked all these gates and a Jewish professor's pass card didn't work. Um, it's bizarre. I, I really don't understand why the university has allowed this to get so out of control. Well, I've. Can, can you stick around for another segment? I want to ask you about consequences, because Robert Kraft, a famed billionaire who we yeah. most of us know uh, as the owner of the New England Patriots for all those years, and for those of you who don't keep uh, track of football, he had a, a fun little massage hobby back in uh, Florida that you might have heard of, but he said that he's, he's cutting them off. So I want, I want to ask you about the response. Is the alumni going to do anything? Will that work? Is it just for show? We have James Varney from Real Clear Investigations here, also an alumnus of Columbia talking about the protests and what's going on there. The anti-Israeli slash pro-Palestinian protests. If you have any comments on that, I'll be taking your calls after we talk to Varney 800-288-WBAP 800-288-9227. This is the James show news talk 820 WBAP now on FM at 93.3. Hey there. Welcome back to the James show news talk 820 WBAP now on FM 
at 93.3. Make it a preset. I don't want to remind you we're doing WeatherCon this Saturday. So from 9.30 to 1.30, if you come out to the Frontiers of Flight Museum at Dallas Love Field, come out to the airport. It'll be free. You can get in. Not only do you get to see the entire museum for free, you'll get to meet WBAP Chief Meteorologist Brad Barton, a couple of the guys from WFAA. There's going to be storm chasing vehicles. There's like five missiles that are going to be there. And I think I'll be there for the duration. You should come anyway. So uh, make it a make it a whole day, something educational to do with the kids. You're welcome. And uh, thank you to the Mullen and Mullen Injury Law Firm. They're the reason why it's free for you. They they pretty much paid for your ticket. So you might as well come on out and join us. WeatherCon Saturday, nine thirty to one thirty. All right, James Varney is uh, sticking along with us here because when you see the protests on TV that happen, you know so many so much of this just seems like. A, a TV show. This is such a distant, mm-hmm. far off place, Columbia. Oh, they blocked the entrance to O'Hare Airport. So none of this affects us directly, but we all kind of wondered, like, how can you how, how can you see what's going on in the Middle East and take this side? Not take the side that has you know skyscrapers and technological advancements and Nobel Prize and a plurality and a democracy. Uh, and you say, no, I think I want to side with the people that. Uh, chop heads off on video, throw gays off of buildings, and parachute into a music festival and get all shooty. So it, it, it's so distant for us. But how different is it for you because you went to Columbia? Do you feel like a personal embarrassment? I I don't think so. I mean, I, I've been gone from Columbia because that was more than 35 years ago now. So, um no, I, I don't. You know, um, I was always proud of the fact that you told me I was one of the only Ivy League people you ever met who didn't brag about having an Ivy League degree. So I don't really go strut around about that. And look, it's not confined to Columbia either. You know, a, a Jewish student was stabbed in the eye at Yale by these uh, pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas. Uh, I hadn't heard that. Yeah. I saw the video on X where they had linked arms at Yale and they were preventing Jewish kids from going into the schoolhouse doors, which had sort of that 1950s Orville Faubus, 1960s George Wallace, or, you know, plug in whatever Democrat here. And it made me 30s Hitler. Well, yeah, but, you know, history kind of rhymes, though. It's like, Mom, Democrats are blocking schoolhouse doors to prevent minorities from going to class again. You know, they just changed the minority that they're persecuting. Yeah, well, of course, Hitler was bought linking hands to bar Jews, so I guess that never changed. I mean, and it, it is a bizarre development in the sense that uh, obviously there's been many prominent Jewish intellectuals that, that occupy prestigious places at Columbia, and, you know, in its history and, and right now on the faculty. And I can't quite understand what's going on. I, I'm I think it is disgraceful. You mentioned before the break about how Robert Kraft is going to cut off donations. He's been a big giver to Columbia. In fact, the Jewish Center at the university is has his name. And that's the only thing that I think is going to change this is if the donors and the trustees say they're not going to give money. These schools got endowments in the billions, so they can withstand some of that shock. But they're also charging rich parents 80 grand or more a year. And that, you know, for for uh, remote learning, that's insane. So and then the last consequence would be if the students are arrested or don't get hired, if if they get identified in all these videos and people say, we're not going to hire you because you are supporting just the things you outlined uh, when you introduced this segment, really despicable, heinous inhumane things that these people are supporting. How would you like to see your alma mater, Columbia, handle these kids? Well, I think, you know, they did call NYPD in, I think it was on Friday. And like you mentioned, Ilhan Omar's daughter was arrested. Thursday, uh, but yes. Was it Thursday? Okay. So like about 100 kids got arrested. Uh, And I assume they were going to sweep it clean and get this under control. Uh, But then they locked the gates and they won't let NYPD in. Uh, Eric Adams, who is, you know, uh, left wing mayor of New York, he wants to send NYPD in and, and clear this up clean it up because it's a black eye for the city as well. You know, Columbia is supposed to be one of the jewels of, of Manhattan, right? And it's just, it looks like a cesspool. It's, it's disgraceful. And, you know, are we really going to have the, the Ivy League churning out people like this and they're going to run 
the Boeing. So, well, we see what's been happening there <laughs> and the government and right. all these things. I mean, it's not a good look to say the least. Uh, if my kid wants to go to Columbia, what would you tell him first? Well, uh, I would tell him it. I mean, it's a great school in a lot of ways. I, I, I think there's tremendous advantages and uh, learning experiences. It, it's in New York City. The faculty, there's some brilliant people there. I mean, it is a great, great school. But I think all of these schools have become so infected by uh, what the root of it is, is Marxist-Leninist thinking. That's what has infected all of these different departments. And I'm not sure that you get the best value for your money there anymore. I really don't, because it is so expensive. I... Uh, I am interested to see how the the prestige of the Ivy League status is is tarnishing because you know it's still held in high regard in many circles right. in American society. Uh, but I know out in Bug Tussle, if if you say you're Ivy League, you kind of get the side eye. You know, it's it's not something you brag about. It's not something you openly you know run around and and talk about at cocktail parties with your pinky out while you're sipping a, an expensive drink. You know, a twenty dollar beverage. Uh, it, it's fun to see how that that mystique and that honor is is slowly degrading in front of our face because they they are giving it away with weird actions like this. They are. They are giving it away. I can tell you that my father, who has audited so many classes at Princeton by now that, that he almost has a Princeton degree, and he's told me that in and he doesn't take labs and things like that, but you know lecture courses. He says frequently the girls the the females will have like J crew website and stuff on their laptops. Cause you can see the screens and the guys will be, you know, playing PGA golf or, or NF Madden or whatever. So, you know, the Ivy league has represented this ticket just because you went there, regardless of whether you worked hard and, and what you might've learned. And I don't know what might happen to its reputation. I think it's, it's, established and burnished enough at this point that if it gets it under control, um, you know, it'll probably survive, but you can't let something like this go on for, for weeks on end because people are going to, you know, they're going to get the right idea, which is something's rotten in Denmark and it needs to be changed. You know, I mean, why wouldn't your kid go to UT Austin? Well, it's not probably a whole lot better down there, but just yeah. at least it's closer. All right, this is James Varney. Check out uh, one of his latest investigations on realclearinvestigations.com, why fatal police shootings aren't declining, some uncomfortable facts to go along with that. Well, the protests are going to continue, and when's it going to end? Probably when tensions die down in the Middle East. I know that sounds like, uh, oh, so you mean never? But look, these things ebb, these things flow. And right now we're in a flow. Don't worry. It'll ebb. I think maybe you've, I don't know, you, you've observed this. I don't know if anyone spelled it out to you, but these, these politically active types, the types that go out and protest, the types that do look, cause look, you and I get upset about political things. You and I get, you know, impassioned about some of these, these issues, but you and I never go make a sign and go stand out in the street. You and I never block a highway. The, the listeners of BAP are not going to camp out in the quad on any campus. So, you know, we, we don't really understand this per se, but the people that do, they can really only stay upset for about three months at a time. And then they've got to cycle through to the next thing. And that's how these things go. And I know you haven't read Saul Alinsky's book. I started to try and read it. I, I, I read like the first chapter and man, some of these books, when you try and read them, it's, it's like they're, not, they're just, there's a disconnect there. Like if it starts off on a false premise and then keeps growing branches off that false premise, it's impossible to keep interest. You ever tried to actually read uh, Das Kapital from Marx? You ever tried to read that? It's almost unreadable. I um, I went back and, you know, how people are always calling you fascist or people. I don't know about you. People call me fascist all the time. It's very annoying because I know I'm not fascist. I've read up into fascism. I don't agree with any of it. Uh, but I have had to go back and read fascism's founding documents because the, the thing that comes up quite often in the talk radio world is people like to say, well, fascism is what happens when you're too far right wing 
and communism is what happens when you're too far left wing. No, fascism is is just a splinter on the on the left side of the spectrum, and you could just take it piece by piece, economically speaking, culturally speaking. It has far more in common with the people who are protesting at Columbia right now than it does with you and me. I mean, just look at their stance on Israel. Who does that sound more like? Benito Mussolini and Hitler or me? Right, exactly. But go back and read it. The uh, The founding documents of uh, fascism come from socialists. The, the first guy is a dude named Giovanni Gentili. He was one of M- Mussolini's friends in, in Italy. And Mussolini, I know he... You, when you see him, he always looks like he's in some sort of military uniform or uh, of some sort. But you know what he is or he was his profession? He was a journalist. He was a writer. Oh, he's one of those people. Yeah, he was kind of like uh, some dude who just fell off of M- MSNBC and they put him in charge of things. But when you go back and read the founding document that Giovanni Gentili wrote, it's not long. It's like 13 pages. It's almost impossible, almost impossible to read. But if you can if you can slog through that, even they will admit that you can only keep these people inflamed about an issue for about three months at a time. And so that's why you see it cycle through. That's why we're going to have a, a, a complaint that's probably racially oriented between now and the election. How do I know? Well, I don't know, but I've recognized the pattern that these things happen in curious four year cycles. How you didn't know what BLM was until like 2012 or so. Then they flared back up in 2016. And then oddly, they had another flare up in 2020. Hell of a coincidence. Amazing. I'm just predicting another one's going to happen between now and then. But they've got to, They've got to cycle through all these issues. I bet you we have a war on women style issue. Well, it used to be called war on women. And then it was called uh, the Me Too movement. Between them, we had the pink hats. That's the nicer word. For it. So don't worry, this will go away and it will probably go away fairly soon. Probably when they let all the kids out for the summer, that dampens the college protest. But don't worry, this this will all cycle away and then we'll all forget about it and then we'll talk about it again in about a year. Uh, usually, I you know, I, I did make one false prediction already about what has to happen, the echoes, the historical echoes that have to happen in this election cycle. I predicted wrongly last year that we would have to see a migrant caravan. I don't think we're going to see that. I think they they tried one a few months ago and it pulled so poorly for the people in charge that they're going to drop immigration as much as they can because now that's a losing issue for them. It was a winning issue when it was kids in cages and tearing families apart and it, it pulled well for them. Now it doesn't pull well for them. We've seen too much. There's been too much. There's too many negative consequences. And so they're going to have to drop that one. But just if it makes you feel any better, don't worry. These are about to go away and they're about to go away pretty soon. Uh, Biden is being accused of having his very fine people on both sides statement. He was asked to condemn the uh, to condemn the protesters that were shouting uh, threats and harassing Jewish kids trying to go to campus. Condemn the anti-Semitic protests on college campuses. I condemn the anti-Semitic protests. That's why I've set up a program to deal with that. I also condemn those who don't understand what's going on with the Palestinians and their, how they're being... Should the Columbia University president resign? Right this way, Mr. I didn't know that. I'll, I'll have to find out more resign? about it. Yeah, he was asked, should she resign? He said, I didn't know about that, so he just misunderstood the question. Yes, I condemn the anti-Semitic protesters and the people who don't understand what's going on in Palestine. So he just equated the two. Now, do I think he thinks that they're on equal footing? Absolutely not. Am I going to do the same thing and have like a gotcha moment where, like, ooh, he thinks the the terrorists and, and the Jews are equally bad? No, nah, I'm not. I'm just going to grant them the levity that they didn't grant you when Donald Trump said uh, uh, the very fine comment about the Charlottesville protesters because 10 seconds later, he said, I did not mean the Nazis and the white supremacists. They all deserve to be condemned, and I condemn them totally. And then he went back to what he was saying. So just throwing that out there. Food for thought. This will get what's being tossed around on Twitter today. So uh, don't get too lathered up about that. Be graceful, even if they don't return the favor. Got any comments on this? 800-288-9227. 800-288-WBAP. I'm James Parker. It's the James Show. News Talk 820. WBAP now on FM at 93.3.